So you can close your tool library now and we'll, uh, we'll get started. Okay. So um, how we're gonna approach this is we have to think about um, how we can machine this part because it's got features on both sides. Um, thankfully, it's, it's all square, um, straight edges and faces. So it lends itself pretty easily to just being a two operation part. You put it in the vise, uh, the machining vise as some piece of raw stock. You machine everything you can, flip it over, machine everything else uh, on the part and uh, you're done with it. So um, the, way that, the way that we um, do that is we create a setup. Um, and within the setup, that's where we draw all of our tool paths, uh, any drilling, uh, any um, manual G code that you wanna write and pass through. Um, so to create a setup, we're gonna go in the top left under uh, setup and hit new setup. And uh, you, can, you can follow along and do it with me or you can sort of just absorb it all and then um, do it again when we're done. We're, I'm recording this, so we'll, uh, we're gonna make a YouTube channel and put it on there. Okay. So uh, what happens is when you open a new setup, Fusion will generate a stock model, this yellow um, sort of translucent um, body around your model. Uh, and it's guessing what model you want. Uh, in this case, it's guessing correctly because there's only one model. So if you click on model body, it highlights that blue. So it guessed correctly, so we can keep it like that. Um, what we wanna do is sort of tell it how it's gonna be oriented in the machine. So right here under orientation, we're gonna switch from model orientation to select Z and X axis. And that's gonna allow us to select um, two planes or two lines um, that we want to assign to the X and Z axis of the machine. And you can also do Z and Y, X and Y, or uh, a couple other things, but we're gonna stick with Z and X. So Z axis, we want to be straight up. So we're gonna select a, a plane that's facing straight up. So that one. And as you can see, it didn't move because it was already in the correct orientation. Then we're gonna do X. So we're gonna click on this right face and it's not gonna move because it's already correct. But say it was maybe like that and you wanted to um, fix it, you can click on that face and now you can flip it around. So we've, we've sort of told, the, told Fusion how it's gonna be oriented in the machine and we've told it which uh, model to select. Now we wanna tell it where our, our zero on the part is gonna be. So you're gonna to have to set up a zero in the machine that matches the zero in your program. And it's gonna be easiest if we just put that zero on one corner of it so that we don't have to sort of center the edge finder or whatever tool you're using to find the, the part. So if you click on box point, um, you can, you'll see that there will be a bunch of uh, points around the stock model. And you can just click on any one of them and move your work offset around. But just for simplicity, let's put it in the front left corner. And this tab, we're all done with this tab now. Uh, so we're gonna go from the setup tab to the stock tab. And this is where we define uh, the stock that we're gonna be using. So we know that we need to reach the bottom of this part with some end mill, which means we can't be holding onto the, the stock anywhere above the bottom of the part. So to sort of tell Fusion that we're gonna be holding onto the bottom of it, we're gonna to go to the stock bottom offset and add maybe 0.3 inches roughly. And now we'll have some room on the bottom to hold on to that material. And we won't hit the vise with the tool. Now we also need some stock on the top of the part, which you can see right here, stock top offset is 40 thousandths of an inch, which is, it's fine. You can leave it at that value. And the sides will make it a little larger, maybe a hundred thousandths. And what you'll see is if you look at it from the top, this 0.1 offset just got added. So if I wanted to have two inches of stock on each side, which I wouldn't, but if I wanted to, I could do two, and it would add two inches on all four sides there. And another convenient little feature is down here uh, under dimensions, it tells you what your stock size is. So if you wanted to go cut, cut some material, you just write that down on a piece of paper and bring it over to your saw and, and cut it up. This third tab, we don't really have to worry about. Um, the default options are pretty much 100% of the time, they're gonna be fine. So then we're gonna hit okay, and that's gonna confirm our setup. You'll see the setup will appear as setup one 
on the left side here. Now that we have a setup, we can start making toolpaths within that setup. So the first thing we're gonna do is make a facing operation just to get rid of the material on the top and face it down to this uh, top height here. So what we're gonna do is do a facing operation. Um, I have a bunch of default toolpaths pinned up here, but if you don't see facing, you can click on the 2D drop down menu and go to face. And it's gonna look similar to the setup tab, but there's five tabs now instead of uh, three. So the first tab is all about your tool. Uh, right now there's no, there's no tool selected. So we're gonna hit select tool and it'll open our tool library. So you'll go to, in your case, it will be in local, but for me, it's in uh, cloud, your parametric library. And we wanna use a face mill, uh, which was already in the tool library. So right here, this three inch face mill and an image of it pops up on the right here. And you can either double click on it or just hit select, either one's fine. So now it's gonna appear. And the position of it right now doesn't matter. Uh, it's actually just positioning it slightly above where we set our zero in the setup. Uh, you'll, you'll see the toolpath draw on once we, once we confirm it. Uh, I'm not gonna really talk about speeds and feeds um, because that's really machining, um, not so much programming. Um, so we're just gonna leave the default values here. And then we're gonna go to the geometry tab. Uh, and geometry, as it's, I mean, as geometry states, is basically uh, the geometry that you're telling the tool to cut. Uh, in this case, because we're starting with just raw stock here, I'm not even gonna change anything. I'm just gonna leave it as no selection. And that's gonna reference the stock model that we specified in the setup over here. And that's, what's, that's what uh, this yellow line is drawn as. So if you look from the top, you'll see it's actually offset. And that offset, um, not coincidentally, is 0.1 inches, the same value that we specified in the setup tab. Uh, I'm gonna to disable tool orientation. I think that's a uh, default that I have put in there because I was doing some multi-axis machining a couple of days ago and probably set it as a default, but you don't need it. Uh, then we're gonna to go to the heights tab. So uh, it's pretty logical actually. You select your tool, tell it where to cut, tell it how high to cut, and we'll talk about the next two as we get to them. So in your heights tab, you have uh, five, four, five, or six um, heights, depending on what kind of tool path it is. Um, clearance and retract height are what are the height that the tool is going to retract to um, between every between linking moves or um, when it's done cutting, it's going to move up to clearance height and move on either to the next tool path or it'll stop the spindle and your program will be over. Retract height is um, Let's say you're cutting around the part and you wanna move over to the other side. It's gonna go up to your retract height, move over maybe to the other corner, plunge down again and continue machining. Um, your retract height is typically set lower than your clearance height because if you're just moving from one side of the part to the other, you don't need to go sky high and then plunge back down. That's just wasting time. Um, so clearance is usually higher than retract. There's also a from selection. So, if you think about it, you wouldn't want to retract 100 thousandths above your model if your stock was 200 thousandths above it, because if you only went 100 thousandths up and you still had another 100 thousandths of stock, and then you made a rapid move across the top, you'd crash the tool and uh, probably break it. So what we're gonna do is, since we haven't faced off the top of the material yet, all of our from um, offsets are gonna be from the stock top. Uh, so we know that. We're gonna be 0.4 inches above it, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, so on. Uh, so that's clearance and retract. The feed height is um, basically where your tool is gonna to start feeding down. So you're not gonna be moving around in the machine at maybe five inches per minute. You're gonna be going at some rapid feed rate. Um, and there's no reason to not use that rapid feed rate until you start getting close to the part because you wanna save time. And this feed height, which is, you can see the green right here, it says feed, is 0.1 inches above the top of the stock, which is fine, that's pretty close. The top height is where we're telling the tool to start cutting. So it's gonna start feeding 0.1 inches above it, and it's gonna start cutting at the top of the stock. And then the bottom height is 
kind of as it sounds, the bottom, the very lowest that, that we want the tool to cut. Uh, in this case, I'm going to set that from selection to model top because we want it to start at the top of the stock and face all the way down to the bottom of the, of the or to the, to the top of the model. So what we've just told Fusion is use this face mill, face this area, and do it between the top of the stock and the top of the model. And that's pretty much as simple as it gets for facing. So then we're gonna move on to the passes tab. And uh, heights tab, you can think of it as um, constraining the tool vertically. Passes and geometry are constraining the tool um, laterally, left, right, forward, and backwards. So some of these values I'm gonna skip over because they're not super critical. Um, but one thing that is important um, is your step over. So if you have one inch wide face mill, you can't step over 2.4 inches because you'd be basically just making slots with it because your step over needs to be at least um, a little bit less than your tool diameter. So we're using a three inch face mill. Uh, so 2.4 is fine. Uh, but if you were using a smaller face mill, you would want to adjust that value. If we wanted to leave some material, um, you could tell it to leave axial stock. And let's say I want to leave 10 thousandths of axial stock. When I generate this toolpath and I zoom in, you'll see that the toolpath is actually not going to hit the model. It's going to stay 10 thousandths off the surface of the model. So moving on to the linking tab. Um, while passes deals with everything related to cutting, Linking deals with everything related to when the tool is not cutting. Um, so that is lead-ins, lead-outs, um, sort of moves around the part if you uh, don't want to retract all the way up and move over. These values are fine. We do want it to rapid retract, get out of there as fast as possible. Uh, keeping the tool down is basically going to prevent it from making unnecessary retract moves. Maximum stay down distance, I usually set to some value just way larger than my part so that um, the tool isn't making unnecessary retract moves. And then extend before retract is, is a pretty important one. Um, if you imagine this face mill moving across the part and it's got a three inch diameter, it's going to plunge outside the material, move across, but we want it to come all the way off the material. We want to get the entire diameter of the tool off the material before it retracts. Otherwise, you'll probably get some weird tool marks near the end. So extend before retract um, tells the tool to go all the way off the part before coming back up. Um, you don't need lead in or lead out um, entries or exits for facing because when you're leading in and leading out, you're not actually in the material. So how the tool moves is not super critical. So I'm gonna hit okay. And that's gonna generate a tool path. And there it is. So like I was telling you, if we look from the side and zoom in, you'll see it's actually leaving some material there. And there's no good way to gauge what that is. You can't like measure from point to point. But if I go back to my passes tab and I disable stock to leave and regenerate it, you see now it's line on line with the model and it's gonna be facing off directly to the top of the model. So that's our first facing toolpath. Um, and we will simulate that to see what it's going to look like. So I'm just going to save this. And if you click on setup just once, so it's dark blue, and then click on simulate here in the actions tab, uh, it's going to show you your stock model, show you your tool. And if you hit play, it's going to actually simulate what it's going to do in the machine. So that's it for facing. Um, you, yours might look a little different, um, depending on if you have any defaults already set, but you can change uh, what it looks like. So if I go from comparison, um, colorization to material, now it's just a uniform color. I like, um, I like comparison because it shows me, or it's a good reminder of where I have stock to leave, where I have and haven't machined. It also, um, has this little key on the right side here that tells you blue means there's more material on there, green means it's intolerance, and red means you've gouged the part and you need to go take another look at your toolpath. So the simulation showed us that our facing operation is fine. So I'm gonna close the simulation and let me just take, oops, it's already open. Let me take a look at the next toolpath that 
I had in here. So the next one is outside of down here. Okay. So let's do that. We faced off the top of the part, but as you can see in the simulation, there's still plenty of material on there. So the next thing we're gonna do is create a roughing tool path to rough around the outside of the of the part. So to do that, we're gonna to go to 2D adaptive clearing. And 2D adaptive is nice because if you tell it where to cut and tell it uh, where your stock is, it'll generate a tool path that gives the tool a very consistent load. And you'll see later on in the passes tab, that load is called optimal load. And that's basically gonna generate a tool path that has a very consistent step over um, and really effectively uses the, the length of that tool to get your highest material removal rate possible. So I'm gonna go back to the tool library and I'm gonna select tool number two. And that is flute length, two inch. It's a two inch long, half inch end mill. I'm gonna use that. Again, I'm gonna leave speeds and feeds default for now. And so we're gonna to go to geometry. And this one's gonna be a little different from facing because we need to actually confine this now or constrain it. Uh, because otherwise, if you just hit okay, it's not gonna let me generate anything because I haven't told it what to do. So pocket selections, I want it to machine out uh, the outside of the Lego. So if I zoom in, there's little chamfers on here. So you have to be careful. If you click on that line there, what it does is it uh, figures out, Fusion guesses that I want to machine outside of this. And you'll see there's a dark blue line. That's my um, like my contour. And then the, the lighter blue is where it's going to actually machine. That's where it knows there's extra material. It's gonna generate that tool path um, um, sort of respecting that boundary. I'm also gonna turn on stock contours. And what that's gonna do is if you look straight down, that light blue ends right where the yellow is. So what I just told Fusion was, I still have material on there that you need to be aware of. Um, so take that into account. The other three you can leave uh, off. Heights tab. Now that we faced off the top of the part, our clearance and retract height can be in reference to the model top because there's no material on top of it. We don't have to be avoiding anything now. So model top, model top. Top height this time is gonna be model top as well because we're gonna be machining from top to bottom. And this time bottom height is not gonna be model top. It's gonna to be model bottom. And we want the tool to go a little bit lower so that we're not, um, we're machining a little bit past it because if you, if you just sent the tool exactly on the bottom, you'd end up with a little hairline when you faced off the other side in the next operation, and you want to avoid that. So I'm going to tell it to go down an additional 10 thousandths, minus 0.01, and you'll see that little value there. So that's our Heights tab. I'm going to go to Passes now. And um, this, is a, this is a roughing operation. 2D Adaptive is only ever roughing. You cannot use it for finishing. Um, what you use for finishing is a 2D contour, and we'll, we'll do that next. Um, so because it's a roughing operation, I, I don't wanna leave, I do wanna leave material on the walls um, because I'm gonna come back and clean those up later. So I'm gonna leave five thousandths on the walls radial. And I actually don't care about axial because like I said, we're gonna be machining 10 thousandths below the bottom. So I'm just gonna set that to zero. Optimal load, um, you'll sort of get a sense for that. Um, if you look on the tool manufacturer's website, or if you have previous experience using the tool or the machine, you know how rigid things are. Just, we're gonna take it easy and maybe give it a 30,000 step over. And um, I'll show you where that value shows up in the tool path once we generate it. Uh, I like to turn smoothing on. Uh, what smoothing does is instead of feeding the machine a bunch of, or I shouldn't say a bunch, thousands or hundreds of thousands of points, it's gonna fit arcs and radii to um, any set of points that um, will fit that radii within this specified tolerance. So if there's gonna be like 20 points going around the outside here when it roughs it, it's gonna fit some radius to that. And that's just gonna decrease the size of the, the NC, the G code file that you're gonna be feeding into the machine. It's just a good thing to do. Um, tolerance, you can leave pretty large here. Um, set it to maybe two thousandths. Um, 
That's not so critical for roughing because as you can see, we're leaving five thousands on the outside. So a two thousand two thousands tolerance is gonna be fine. We're not gonna gouge them all or anything. Moving on to linking. Again, we can allow rapid retract just to get out of there as fast as possible. Um, your stay down level um, is pretty important. I'm gonna leave it at most for now. And you'll see when we generate the toolpath um, what that means. Basically, the tool is going to be uh, cutting around the outside of the part. And if it finishes over here and needs to go over to the other side, um, stay down level determines whether or not it's going to retract, move over and go down, or make some fancy linking move and stay down and go all the way around the part. We'll leave it at most for now, though. Uh, no engagement feed rate can be set to some large value. Uh, no engagement feed rate basically is when the tool is not cutting uh, and it's moving around the part, how fast can it move? And you're not cutting, so it can be as fast as you want, really, as fast as your machine can move. The ramp type here is not going to be critical because we're not plunging or spiraling into a pocket. We're just going to be plunging outside the material and slowly stepping our way in. Um, but there are a couple options here. You can plunge into a pre-drilled hole. You can just straight plunge and let the end mill plunge for you, or you can helix down and make a little spiral down. But as we, as you'll see, we're not gonna be doing any helical interpolation. So I'm gonna hit okay. I'm gonna generate this tool path. And it looks a little funky because you think there's some offset there. So you're not actually gonna be touching the part, but these lines are based on the center point of the tool. So this value here, this radius is, is one tool radius. So it actually is gonna be making contact with the part. Uh, and so as I was saying, that 30 thousandths optimal load, as I was saying, I'll, I'll show you where that shows up. This value, this uh, dimension here between step overs, that's your optimal load. So if I go back and make this 10 thousandths and regenerate, you're gonna see a couple more passes now because I told it to go easier. So we'll go back to our original 30,000 value and uh, let's simulate it now. So again, uh, click off of any selections, click on your setup, simulate. And uh, instead of just playing and waiting, we already know the face mill toolpath is good. So I'm just gonna fast forward past that one. And then I'm gonna hit play and watch this one cut. And um, if you orbit around using your middle mouse button, the simulation pauses just so you can get a better look at it. And you can see here, if I pause it, this tool is taking a little cut there. And the width of that cut is the optimal load, 30 thousandths. And you can also see it's cutting all the way around down there. It's gonna walk all the way around the part. And now it's done. Uh, you can see, however, it's still blue, meaning we have some stock to take off there. It's not quite intolerance. So what we're gonna do now is close the simulation. I'm gonna right click on this uh, roughing adaptive toolpath, and I'm gonna go to create derived operation, 2D milling, 2D contour. And what that does is instead of, I hit escape, instead of going back, making a 2D contour, picking your tool again, redoing all your feeds and speeds, all your geometry, all your heights, right-clicking and doing create derived operation, transfers all the um, important numbers and heights from the last toolpath and transfers them into here so that you don't have to reselect anything. So if you go to geometry, you can see it's already selected. Uh, however, for 2D contour, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna turn off stop contours um, because we're just taking one pass around the outside. That selection is good there. Again, our heights transferred to, there's that negative 10 thou we set. Passes, um, not a whole lot transfers because they're pretty different tool paths. One's roughing, one's finishing. Um, so yeah, you can see our stock, we had 5,000th radial, now we're finishing it. So we don't want any stock to leave. We just wanna take one pass around the outside. One thing I do like to do is have some small finishing overlap. And what that does is instead of maybe leading in right here, walking around the part, 
and meeting out in the exact same spot. Uh, it's going to go all the way around the part and then past it a little bit, this 50,000th value. Uh, and what that's going to do is eliminate any little cusp or witness mark that you might see traditionally from um, leading the tool in and leading it out in the exact same place. That 50,000th will get rid of that. In the linking tab, I'm going to leave all my defaults uh, the way they are. We don't need to keep tool down because it's only doing one pass around and then going on to the next tool path. So I'm going to hit OK. And if I look straight down, you'll see the finishing overlap. You, see, you can see how they don't quite lead in and lead out at the, uh, the same place. If I were to make that value larger or zero, I will see if they lead in and lead out at the exact same spot. We don't want to do that. So again, click off anything, click on your setup, simulate. No facing is good, we know roughing is good. Now we'll just play the contour. And that looks good. So the top's faced off, outside's roughed out, and it's finished. And you can tell it's good because it's green within your 2000th tolerance. So now we're gonna move on to roughing in between the uh, little nubs here. And I believe that was done with the 2D adaptive. So we're gonna do another 2D adaptive, select a different tool this time. Uh, the reason I'm selecting a different tool is because this is a half inch tool and it's not going to, ooh, don't crash. It's not going to fit between these nubs. So we have to select a slightly smaller tool. It'll be a 3 8 tool. I'm gonna leave the default feed rates and we're gonna to go to geometry. So there are, in this case, there's gonna be two ways you can select um, the pocket that you wanna cut. You can click on each individual corner here and tell it to cut outside of each of those nubs or you just click on the face. I mean, you, you, you choose what's easier for you, but it seems to me that just clicking on one face instead of eight, eight uh, corners would be easier. Um, stock contours we're going to turn on, uh, and the default this time is actually going to be wrong because it's assuming that we haven't machined outside the part, but we have. So we're going to click while nothing is selected, and click on the outside of the part, and that yellow line just switched to the uh, outline of the part because that's where there currently is material. There's no material around the outside. We just took that off. So we're going to go to heights now. Again, clearance and retract our model, model top. Top height is going to be model top because we're going to start roughing at the top here. And the bottom top, this is going to be the first time that we're going to use a selection. So make sure that selection is picked out and then click on reference. And we're going to click on that face there. Now, if you look from the side, your bottom height, this blue plane is in line with that face. So now we just told Fusion rough between these two, uh, these two heights here. Moving on to passes. This is a 3 8 inch tool, but it's not taking a very uh, deep cut. So I'm gonna keep 75, maybe 80 thousandths optimal load. And this time we want stock to leave on both the floor and the wall, but it doesn't need to be quite that much. It can be 5 thousandths for both. I'm going to keep moving on just to reduce the size of that G-code. Move on to linking. Uh, again, your no engagement feed rate can stay at some ridiculously high value. Uh, and your stay down level most uh, can stay at most. And this time I'll, I'll demonstrate the uh, difference between all these. I'm going to hit OK. And it's going to generate a toolpath that somewhere right here plunges outside and just walks around the part and goes in, roughs everything it can, moves out, roughs everything, moves out, and just goes through the entire, uh, that entire little nub area and roughs all that out. So you can see the tool is not moving up and down too frequently. But if I change my stay down level to 10%, it's gonna make a ton of retract moves. 
Mm. Well, I stand corrected. But uh, usually what you would see is um, way more retract moves. I think what's causing it in this case to not make a bunch of retract moves is that um, it's figured out the most efficient toolpath and it doesn't need to make all these retract moves. Uh, so it's only doing what it needs to. So we'll, we'll put it back to most. All right. So again, we'll simulate that. Uh, and another way that you can skip through toolpaths is just by clicking on uh, a toolpath and that will fast forward to that point. Click on that one. Yeah. So we'll play that. Let's see what that looks like. And you can also adjust the speed with the little um, bar down here. So now it's going to go inside there, rough everything you can. And I'm just going to skip that because we know what's going to happen. So now walls blue or floor is blue, walls are blue, which tells us that we have to do some finishing operation. Um, like I said, adaptive is never a finishing operation. So similar to this adaptive, we're going to right click, create drive operate, create derived operation, 2D milling. And this time we're going to do a 2D pocket. And 2D pocket is similar to 2D adaptive in that it, it can be used for roughing, but it's not a quote unquote smart toolpath. It's not going to present the tool with an even amount of material to cut. It's just going to just slam the tool in wherever it can fit, um, which is fine when you're taking small amounts of material off, but not ideal when you're hogging off tons of material. Um, uh, this time we can keep uh, everything that we previously selected the same because we still want to cut around each nub and on the face. We still uh, agree that our stock contours have not changed. Our heights still going to be the same. We're still going down to that face. Uh, passes this time is going to be a little bit different because we don't want to leave any material. We want to finish the walls and we want to finish the floors. So you disable, disable all your stock to leave. And uh, the most important value here is this maximum step over. Uh, this is similar to optimal load, uh, but optimal load the toolpath really tried and tried to maintain that optimal load. Maximum step over is just saying you might step over five thousandths, you might step over two hundred ninety nine, but the absolute maximum you can do is three hundred thousandths. It can go it can go way below, but top is three hundred thousandths. In the linking tab, uh, I'm going to keep all these uh, the same. Actually, I'm going to disable keep tool down. Uh, because the 2D toolpaths are, are not model aware. They only know what you've told them in the geometry tab. So if you keep tool down, there's a chance that it will just make a rapid move or a linking move right through the one of these nubs. And uh, you'll only catch that if you simulate it. Uh, I'm going to leave my lead-ins and lead-outs the same. And we can plunge because it's not going to be plunging into the material. It's just going to be plunging off to the side. And then hit OK. Um, sorry, can I interrupt? Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Why are you posting this on the pod after this? Sorry, say it again. Are you are you uh, recording this session and? Yeah, post? yeah, it's recording. Oh, okay. Um, because yeah, I have a class at six um six or five and. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and, and take off whenever you need to. Okay. So, where are you posting this recording? Um, it's, we'll probably post it on, on a YouTube channel that is yet to be created. Oh, okay. Um, if you want to, uh, put your email in the chat, I'll take note of it and I'll email you the channel when we create it. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll do, that. Do, you, do you have to go right now? Yeah, I can still like two more minutes, but. Okay. Yeah. Just put your email in the chat and, um, yeah, uh, I'll go through one, one more quick tool path. So let's simulate that. Go to the 2D pocket, and uh, now you're going to see it's going to finish everything that it can. Fast forward there. And now that looks pretty good. The last thing that we're going to do before we engrave, but we'll do that next time, is um, just put a chamfer on, on the top of all eight of these nubs. So I'm going to go to 2D contour, 
I'm going to select a chamfer mill, tool five. My geometry is actually going to be the bottom of these chamfers because we want the chamfer mill to know what size the chamfer is. And if you select the top of the um, nub, it's just going to try and trace out that same shape, but we want it to actually figure out what this, what size chamfer that is. My height this time is actually going to be selected contours, and my offset's going to be zero. Instead of um, offsetting it in the heights tab, what I'm going to do is enable chamfer. My chamfer width will be zero, and my tip offset, I'll say maybe 50 thousandths. And what that's going to do is it's going to drive the tip of the chamfer tool. It's going to, by default, go straight on there. And then if I want, if I want 50 thousandths offset, then it's going to move down 50 thousandths and over 50 thousandths so that we're not cutting with the tip of the tool. Linking should all be fine. So I'm going to hit OK. Now it's going to generate that chamfer tool back. Simulate it. And if I fast forward, you'll see now all that material is going to disappear. And so that is how to approach the first operation. I'm also going to engrave that. Um, but if you need to hop off, that's fine. And I'll, I'll continue recording and then uh, end it once I engrave it. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Have a good one. All right, so I'm just gonna finish this. I'm here, uh, and then I'm pumped to hear what's next. Hey, are you all done with your classes? I am, yes. So uh, catching the tail end. Okay, uh, so I'm just gonna, I just programmed uh, everything except the engraving. Uh, so now I'm gonna engrave it, the little Lego sign. So in the um, model tree here, what I did was I imported a, a picture of the Lego logo and I just traced over it and I had some trouble um, using a sketch to define the toolpath. So what I just did was I extruded the sketch and then I just used the outside of the solid model of each letter as, as uh, the toolpath. So if you hide and show Lego letters, you'll uh, they'll appear and disappear. So I'm gonna, I believe I usually use trace for engraving. So I'm gonna use a trace toolpath. And I'm gonna select in a, the tool library, this two millimeter ball end mill. And all these tools um, are tools that I have loaded in the machine that I usually use uh, at work. So these, they're not just random, they're just tools that are in the machine. But uh, you use whatever tools you want. Uh, I'm gonna leave the feeds and speeds alone. For geometry, uh, instead of asking for like stock contours or a pocket selection, it's asking for curve selections. Uh, because trace is technically a 3D toolpath and that it can move in all three axes simultaneously, but it doesn't have to. So I'm going to click on the outside profile of Lego and the inside. Don't forget that one. Um, you could have also chosen the bottom. doesn't matter. I'm going to leave tool orientation off. That's for four and five axis um, positioning. The heights tab um, is... Oh, wait, actually, maybe I did use the sketch. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah, nice. Disable those letters. So in the Heights tab now, uh, clearance uh, can be above the model top, retract can be above the model top, and feed height you can set to some close value to the model top. It doesn't need to be feeding from a very high distance. You can wrap it to some close plane and then start feeding. Uh, and the passes tab is where we're gonna tell the tool how deep to engrave that. And what we're gonna, how we're gonna do that is stock believe. Um, and trace can be used as a sort of 2D contour, or you can tell it to not, not cut on one side, left or right, but cut on the center. So literally trace it. So we're going to use center to trace out the center of these letters. 
and then put our radial stop to leave at zero, and then axial at a negative value. And that's going to drive that toolpath down two thousandths below that surface. And two thousandths doesn't sound like much, um, but if, if I were to actually draw um, a two millimeter um, circle in here and then bump it down two thousandths, you'd see it's actually decently wide. I'm going to turn smoothing on. That's just going to minimize the decode size. And that should be it. So interestingly, you are not going to be able to see this tool path because it's two thousandths below the surface of the part. Um, sometimes you can kind of get around that by looking at it at a weird angle like that. But you can hide the model and see that that tool path is indeed there. Except what's annoying, or not annoying, but what you have to deal with is the fact that that sketch that I created is only on one of these nubs. So we're gonna to have to pattern it. So if we use measure and just figure out the distance between these, it's one and a quarter and it should be uniform, you know, one and a quarter. If I right click on trace and hit uh, add to new pattern, uh, I can uh, do a circular pattern, I can mirror it, I can duplicate it, I can change the work offset with each duplication. I'm just going to do a linear pattern. I'm going to select direction one, so any line that's parallel with these this array of nubs. So choose that edge. And then I'm going to enable an additional direction on that one. And now it's going to make multiple rows and multiple columns. So spacing for direction one, which is going to be left to right is going to be that 1.25 that we just measured. And we want four of them. Same thing for direction two, 1.25. And you only want two, but you can see it's actually going the wrong way. So if you just select flip direction two, you go the right way. Just hit okay. And now this toolpath individually only appears once, but the pattern makes it appear eight times. So if we simulate it again, move all the way to the engraving, just gonna fast forward, it does it once, again, and it's gonna keep doing it until it's done. Just hide the tool from the top, and you can see it's actually decently wide. We could probably even do with, with a little less deep of an engraving. So that, is how I would program the first side. Let me check the finished model, see if that's what I did. Oh yeah, let's uh, chamfer the outside. Why'd you do that? So just like we um, chamfered the uh, corners, the, the tops of the nubs, I'm just gonna do that around the outside. Uh, so to do that, there's no sense in just redoing the entire tool path. So if you just click on it once and hit control D, that's going to duplicate it. You can open it again, go to geometry tab, delete all your selections just by hitting the X and zoom in, select the bottom. And at uh, this time we have to be careful because we're using a 5 8 inch chamfer mill. And if that's the tip of our tool, that's interesting. Oh, that's not the tip of the tool. Um, if the tool comes in and um, has this some sort of 45 degree angle here, we have to make sure that it's not going to um, gouge up here. So to make sure that that's not going to happen, I'm going to give it a pretty large tip offset, maybe like 0.2 inches. And then if we go and simulate that, display my tool. You'll see it's way down there. That's 200 thousandths, and it's nowhere close to hitting any of these nubs. So there we go. Everything's chamfered, clean, intolerance, or at least in the program, it's intolerance. And that's how I would approach it. So I'm going to end the recording. And yeah.